awesome. Right. Rhymes. Right. <laughs> this is Tony, DJ TPL. Recipes Fife Dog, right? Yeah. Uh, how, how's life? Good? Going well? yeah, yeah. yeah. Did you know that Jizza, before the age of 27, had Wu-Tang and his solo album under his belt already? I mean, yeah, all the, the Wu-Tang Clan people were pretty young. Yes. Yeah. But that's like, incredible. but that's just Rizzo's older, I think. Yeah. Right. And he had his first album was Prince Rakim. That yeah. was kind of goofy. Yeah. But then he got yeah. with Wu Tang. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah there's no Wu Tang questions on the exam this year. Uh, previous years there have been. So don't feel like you, you need to know these things. All right. Again, awesome. Thank you, DJ Two PL. Um, for, for you guys, lot lot to go over. Uh, the list is getting longer. So Project One is due this Sunday at midnight. Again, we're having the special office hours on on Saturday. That's in person. Uh, they announced it on Piazza. I think it's on the fifth floor um, in one of the carols. Homework two has been bumped out to uh, October 4th. It's a Wednesday. Make sure to make, make it not have be the same due date as Project 1. Homework three will be out this week. That's going to be due four days later. And again, okay, that kind of sucks that it kind of cram it so quickly. But because the, the midterm exam, which will cover things um, uh, which will cover things that in, in homework three, we want to get that uh, back to you guys and graded before the, the midterm exam on, on Wednesday. So midterm, midterm is going to be in class here uh, on October 11th. It's a Wednesday. and be re- during the regular class time. Uh, if you need accommodations, please email us. And so we can, we can start uh, organizing and, and taking care of the logistics. Don't post on Piazza. Yes. Is it possible to have homework three a bit earlier? I, we're trying to get homework three out now. It should be out today. I don't know if it could be out today. Yes, that's the plan. But the trouble is, like, it doesn't cover things. It's going to cover, like, sorting and, and joins, which will cover, like, next week. Um, all right, any questions about any of, the, any of these things? Yes? Is there any idea of when homework two, uh, sorry, project two will be due? Uh, it's whatever it says on the website now is, is, is the current plan. Yes. Yes. At the end of fall break? Yeah. All right, well, we'll, we'll go do, I'll, let me go double check that. Um, I thought we moved it, so, so we didn't have to be, you had to do it over in fall break. Yes, we, we will take care of that. Other questions? All right, cool. All right, so the, the last two classes, we've talked about data structures. We talked about hash tables, and then we talked about B plus trees. Um, and I prefaced our conversation going into discussing the hash tables and B plus trees stuff to say that. To simplify the discussion and, the, and, and the, the, the explanation of these data structures and the algorithms that are used to, to, to manipulate them or work with them, um, we're going to assume that it's single-threaded because that just makes your life easier. Uh, but of course, in any modern system in, uh, you know, with today's hardware, you need to support multiple threads or multiple workers running at the same time. Again, I'm going to try to use the word workers because that can mean either a thread or a process. Postgres is not multi-threaded, it's multi-process. Most modern systems are multi-threaded, but the idea is the same. But still, again, we want to be able to have multiple workers running at the same time be able to access these data structures so that if one of them has to stall because they're going to disk, we can have other, other workers run at the same time and, and do useful things. Right? A system will look very unresponsive if, if you only had a single worker, uh, again, assuming it's a thread, and then I'm going to go access, run some query. And then as soon as I have to go to my page table, and the thing I don't need is, is the, the page I need isn't there, I have to stall because I got to go to disk and get it. Well, why that, while we're stalled, the CPU is essentially stalled, we can have other threads, other workers do useful things. So that's the goal of, of, of what we're going to talk about today is how do you actually make these, these data structures uh, thread safe. And so what I'll say is that this is how most systems are going to be implemented. Uh, most systems will, will, will try to take advantage of multiple threads. Uh, there's, a, there's a sort of category of systems that actually don't do any of the things we're going to talk about today. Uh, and the most famous one is probably Redis, that it's a single process, single thread. So all the latching stuff we're going to talk about today, they don't have to do because they know no other threads running at the same time. There'll be other systems where they'll have, uh, they'll still be multi-threaded, but they'll maybe have only one writer thread, but multiple reader threads running at the same time. And that simplifies a bunch of things, but you still need the latching protections that we're going to talk about today. Okay. So the, 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 the thing that we're going to use to, to, to enforce the, uh, the threads or workers to behave a certain way so that we don't end up with uh, corrupted data and invalid data structures is going to be called a concurrency control protocol. And again, for today's class, we're going to see how we, we do this for workers. 
after the midterm, we'll discuss how we use concurrent control to, uh, to coordinate transactions. And so you can sort of think of this, this current control protocol is like the traffic cop of the system that allows you to tell, tell different workers who's allowed to do what at what given time, right? And the idea is they're going to be operating on some shared object or some critical section, and we don't want to have them interfere with each other and cause problems. And the, the two types of problems you could have are logical correctness and physical correctness. And I think I mentioned this uh, last week as well. So the logical correctness, the idea is that if I insert a key into my B plus tree, I insert key five, and then if I come back and now try to look for key five, I should see it. Or the other example I said was uh, if I delete key five and I come back and try to look for key five again, I shouldn't see it. All right, so at a logical level, that's, you know, we want to make sure that we, we, we're seeing the things we should see in our data structures. The thing that we care about in today's class is the physical correctness, meaning how do we ensure that if we're walking through a hash table or traversing the B plus tree, and at some point we've got to follow a pointer, like a, like a page ID, to take us somewhere else, that page ID is, is correct. Like it's not going to take us to uh, a, you know, a table page that has a bunch of garbage in it. Because right? what happens if, if you go follow a page and you start looking at data that doesn't look like you expect to look like, you're going to have a sec fault because you're going to try to read back past some buffer or things, things are going to break or you get corrupted data. So again, logical correctness we'll worry about later after the midterm. Today's class is really about physical correctness. So I first want to describe, uh, go over it quickly of what, uh, what latches are again and how, how do you actually implement them inside of a database system. And again, the takeaway here is that we don't want to, ideally we don't want to rely on what the operating system uh, gives us in terms of latches. Then we'll see a simplified example of, of how to do hash table latching. And we'll spend most of our time doing B plus tree latching. And we'll see a sort of a, a basic version and an optimized version. And then we'll finish, finish off talking about how to handle uh, leaf node scans. OK? All right, so I think I showed this slide before. And again, I just want to revisit it again. Uh, this distinction between lo la locks and latches. And again, if you're coming from the OS world or distributed world, they, uh, they might mean, what I, when I say latch, they might think lock. right? But in, in database, that's what we care about uh, mostly in my life and in this course. So we need, we need to make sure we understand what we're talking about when we say lock versus the latch. So a lock's going to be this high-level primitive uh, protection primitive that allows us to uh, protect the logical contents of our database, like a, like a tuple, a database, a table. Right, and the when we acquire one of these locks, the transaction will hold that lock for the for the the duration of that transaction. It's not always true. We'll see examples where we can release locks maybe early, um, but for our purposes today, we'll, we'll assume that's the case. And then there'll be some higher level mechanism within our concurrent control protocol that's going to ensure that we don't have any deadlocks. And then if a deadlock does arise, then the the, the database will have a mechanism to be able to roll back the changes that the transaction made to make it look as if it didn't, you know, it didn't make any changes. So we don't, we don't have any partial updates. Today, we're focused on latches. And so the latches are going to be the low-level primitives that we use to, to protect critical sections in our, in our data structures from one worker versus, you know, against, against another. And so the, the duration of the lifetime that we're going to hold a latch is going to be very short. Like, go, like, think of a critical section. I'm going to go take a latch on a page, make some change, and then release that latch immediately. And, uh, and because it's going to be very simple, we want to minimize the amount of bookkeeping we're, we're taking for these latches. We don't want to have, we don't, the, the database is not going to be able to automatically roll back any changes for us. We want to avoid deadlocks and, and try to not make any changes unless we acquire the latch for something so that we don't have to roll things back. We're going to have sort of minimal coordination between the, between the different workers running at the same time. Whereas in the lock case, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but there will be a table literally internally called a lock table. And you go look in there, you can see who holds locks uh, for different objects. In latches, we don't want to maintain any of that because that's so expensive relative to the amount of work we want to do within a critical section in our data structures. So there's this, there's this table I also like from the, the book I recommended last time from this guy, Gritz Graffy, the, the B-Tree book. Um, when again, it shows this, this distinction between the locks versus latches. And the way to sort of to read this table is within a column, you read down and say, you know, what the thing is protecting, how it's protecting it, and the different ways it's protecting things. So for example, a lock is going to separate transactions from each other, uh, and it's going to protect the, the logical database contents, pages, or sorry, tuples, tables, databases. 
and we can hold them for the entire length of the transaction. We'll talk about modes in a second, but we can take a lock in, for an object in different modes, like exclusive, shared, in, intention updates we'll get, to, we'll get to later. And that the database will provide either deadlock detection or deadlock prevention mechanisms built in to avoid these problems. And then, again, these are the mechanisms to do this. And then the information that we're going to keep track of what locks are being held is being kept in, in a lock manager, a, a, like a centralized uh, data structure. Today, again, we're focused on uh, latches. So lockers, latches are going to protect workers from each other. This would be only for in-memory data structures. So like, this is literally for like, the you know, B plus trees in memory. But once it's, I, you know, if, if, a, if a page within our B plus tree gets flushed out to disk, I wouldn't hold the latch for that thing when it goes out to disk because it's, it's meaningless. Right? It's protecting the critical sections. There's only be two modes we can hold our latches in, read and write. Uh, and the way we're going to uh, handle deadlocks is through co coding discipline. But us as the systems developers have to write good code to make sure there's no deadlocks. Easier said than done, sure. But like, we, you know, there's, there's not going to be something, some other part of the system that, that's going to bail us out. And we're going to keep the, the, the information about these latches are actually in, embedded in the data structure itself. So there won't be a, a centralized, centralized thing. Again, this makes more sense when, when we start walking through the different data structure types. And so the lock stuff we'll cover in, in, after the midterm in lecture 15. All right, so our latches only have two modes. It can be either read mode or a write mode. So read mode are there are commutative operations where you can have multiple workers take a latch in a read mode at the same time because you know whatever they're doing isn't going to, uh, you know, there, isn't going to break the, whatever the data structure is or cause any, or cause any uh, conflicts, right? Like if I need to, have, if two two workers need to read the same page, and I can take that in read mode, well that 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 doesn't they're not doing any writes, so it doesn't break anything, so I, I can go ahead and, and have them both run at the same time. Write mode or exclusive mode is when you know one thread is, is, wants to access the object and actually make changes to it. And I don't want any other threads to run at the same, to, to, to operate on my object at the same time. So only one, only one worker can hold the latch in, in write mode. And that blocks everyone else out. Else out. All right? And a really simple compatibility matrix will look like this. If I, have a, if I have a read mode, if I have a latch in a read mode, and someone wants to get a latch in read mode, I can do that. That's allowed. But any, any other combination where at least one of the latches either holds it in write mode or wants to get it in write mode, I have, I have to deny that. So again, going back to what I was saying before about coding discipline, like the stupidest thing to do is to take every latch in write mode, even though you're only going to read it. It'll protect all your data structures, but like you, you know, it's, you're basically going to get relegated to a single thread system. Uh, and likewise, if I take my latch in read mode, but I start making changes to whatever it's protecting, then that's, that's our fault. That's the programmer's fault. And the system crashes, that's on us. All right? And there isn't any, uh, without getting into like uh, verifiable languages, there isn't really any mechanism in C++ or Rust that's going to protect us for these things. All right? Because the p compiler can't, can't know. All right, so let's talk about how you, how you want to implement latches. So ideally, we want a latch that has uh, uh, small memory footprint because we don't want to store a lot of, a lot of additional metadata for our latch because, again, these are be embedded in the data structure itself. Um, and ideally, we want to have it be when there's no contention in the system, meaning there's no two threads or workers trying to acquire a latch at the same time, we want to go fa as fast as possible with min minimal overhead. I, mean, I acquire the latch and do my thing right away. If we have to, if we can't get the latch we need, then we have to make a decision of how long we should wait and how we want to wait. And we'll see different scenarios uh, how we want to do this. Um, and ideally, also, too, we, would, we, would, we don't want to have a bunch of metadata per latch about like, who's waiting for this latch, because that's now basically a queue for every single latch you could have in your data structure. And I think of like a giant B plus tree with a billion entries, how many, how many pages you're going to have in there. Each of those could have. Uh, now their own priority queue, right? So again, coming from the database world, we say we don't we don't want to rely on the OS to do any of these things. But then the OS people say the database people don't know, know what they're doing, and they should not be implementing their own latches. Um, and you can see this in like the the Linux mailing list. So here's a post from Linus uh, <laughs> saying like, oh yeah, like you know don't you should not be writing your own latching thing. And it basically says here, like, should not use spin locks, but I'll explain that in a second. In user space, that's us. We're the data system running in user space. 
He says, you should not be using spin locks if you roll yourself unless you know what you're doing, and the chances are you know what you're doing is low. Um, he's wrong, um, despite being Linus, right? All right, so I'm going to go through three basic implementations uh, of, of how to implement latches. Um, there's more advanced ones, like the parking lot stuff from Apple. This is probably the best one to use right now. Um, and then there's the MCS locks, uh, which is a, a queuing thing. Um, we'll cover this in the, in the advanced class, but for our purpose here, we, we don't need to know this. But it's, we need to understand sort of the basic implementation of what, what latches are actually doing. So that we, when you start sprinkling them in your code, you understand the ramifications of them. Yes? You mean pthread mutexes? Yeah. We'll get to that in a sec. Yes, her question is, why, what's wrong with C++ mutexes? So if you call mutex in C++, what do you actually get? But, 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 but of what? Yeah, but like, but like who's implementing that? Uh, pthread. But how does a pthread work? Two more slides. OK. <laughs> um, OK. All right, so uh, actually, maybe this, this, this is the slide. All right, so the most basic, all right, yeah, no, I take it back. This is, this is database world. We'll talk about the OS one next. So the most basic uh, latch you can implement is called a test and set, test and set spin lock. Sometimes it's called a spin lock. And I realize I'm calling them spin locks when they're really latches, right? Um, but this is the most simplest way to implement this is because it literally is a 64-bit memory address uh, that you're just going to do an atomic compare and swap on to see whether you can set it. And if you can't set it, then you spin and keep trying to set it over and over again. Like the code would literally look like this. I declare a, an atomic Boolean. This is just a syntactic sugar for declaring something that's atomic. And then now I have this, my latch here, and I call it test and set. And it literally is just trying to set, uh, it checks to see whether it's set the, it, the current value is zero. If, 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 if yes, then I can set it to one, and I can do that in a single, single instruction automatically. So it's not like if, then this, then that, and somebody else can come, come and swoop in and change it before, before, I can, before I can. It literally is one instruction to go and apply this change. And if I can't get it, then I just spin. Because we're doing this in the database, database level and the in user space, we can decide whether how many times we want to retry, whether we want to yield the threat to the OS, or abort ourselves and restart. All right? Why is this bad? What's that? Waste. So wait, so I heard, I heard waste. You said you're busy waiting. Yeah. So you're basically spinning the cycle, spinning the CPU. Check, 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 check over and over again. But okay, okay. So I could put maybe like, I could put a you know exponential back off to say okay, I tried to get, it, I couldn't get it. Wait one millisecond, two milliseconds, four milliseconds, right? Um, actually, the the. So that's a challenge that you're just spinning over and over again. Another problem is going to be cache coherence traffic, right? So again, assuming I have a two-socket CPU, the, the the latch I'm trying to acquire is over here on this this NUMA region. Does anyone, anyone know what NUMA is? Uh, Non-uniform memory access. Basically, like if I have two sockets in my CPU, or two two sockets or more, two or more sockets on my, my motherboard, each CPU socket is going to have DRAM that's close to it, and it's really fast to talk to that. But I can also talk to memory that's, on, that's over on another socket, and they call it, call it a NUMA region. But that, that traffic is much slower because I got to go over this interconnect between one socket to the other, right? And so Intel, they do a lot of work to make sure like you, when you write programs, you don't know and, and don't technically have to know where memory actually is physically located. But of course, now you could have uh, your program access something that's on another socket, and it gets really, really slow. And the horror tries to play games and move things around for you, try to speed things up. We can ignore that for now. And for this class, we don't have to worry about NUMA. I just want to explain that like, this, this, uh, anyway, a worker running on this, pro this CPU over here wants to acquire the latch on th that's in this, this other socket CPU memory. Uh, so it's going to keep spinning and over and again. But now like, it's, it's all this traffic over this interconnect uh, that's going to slow my, my, my entire database system down. Right? So this is inefficient because I'm spinning, but also like, the traffic on the actual hardware itself is, is expensive. So now her question is, you know, why, what's wrong, or how does actually the, the, the C++ mutex actually work? So this is called a blocky mutex. It's the easiest thing to use because it's again, built in C++. Um, and it, it, uh, you know, it's basically you acquire and release. It's, there's not a lot of mechanisms in it. Um, and the way you use it is sort of like this. Like you lock it and unlock. You do whatever you want in the middle. So I asked her, how, how is this thing actually implemented? Does anybody know? So if you call SCD mutex, what do you get in C++? Pthread mutex. What, how is pthread mutex implemented? 
It's called a Futex. It's in Linux. Right, did anybody, everybody heard of Futex before? Fast user space Mutex. So the way it works is it has the spin lock that I just showed in the last slide. In user space, they'll have their own little test and set thing you can do. But if you can't, if you try to acquire it and you can't, uh, then you fall back to a heavy, heavy weight mutex inside the kernel. So, so if, the, if the, no one holds the latch with a futex, I try to acquire it. If no one holds it, then I just do a compare and swap real, real fast in user space, and I'm done. And I, 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 my program or my thread keeps running. If I can't get it, then the OS takes control of us, and we go down now into the kernel. And then we get descheduled because it knows that I can't run until I, the thing I'm waiting for is available. But what's down in the kernel? How are they keeping track of threads? What's that? Sorry, say it again? Blocking cube. Blocking cube, but like, what is, like, there's also, uh, wait, no, there, there, there's a, the schedule has its own hash table to keep track of like what threads are running. So like, and they have, they, have, they use their own latches to protect that data structure. So if I can't acquire this, I go down in the kernel and I get descheduled, and that's very, very expensive. Sys calls are expensive. We want to avoid them, right? Right. So actually, this is just the diagram like this. So again, I have two my my two two workers running different sockets. They both try to acquire at the same time. One of them will get the user space latch. The other guy tries to go down and get the OS latch, and they get they get descheduled, right? And again, this is this is slow because anytime you involve the OS, this this is bad. So the last two, last two, first two latches I showed you, they didn't really have modes. It was just like it's all or nothing. Um, and so the way you implement this in a uh, in 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 C++ with a read-writer latch, you can use shared mutex. I think we, we do the read-write uh, lock in in bus tub, um, which is just a pthread read-write lock. And the way this basically works is that the latch itself is going to have its own priority queues, its own counters to keep track of like how many threads are waiting. You actually can define the scheduling policy for the, 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 the latch itself. So the idea here is that if I have a, 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 write, a reader thread comes along and wants to acquire the latch, I go check to see whether anybody's waiting, waiting for the read latch or the, right, the, the latch reading in read mode or write mode. Uh, if it's available, then I increment my counter to say somebody's holding the the read latch now, and I, I go ahead and do whatever I want. And now if anybody else comes along and also wants to acquire it in read mode, the system knows, I'm, the, 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 the latch knows I'm in read mode right now, so it can let the other guy uh, run as well. But now if, if a, if a write, lat, write worker comes along, tries to acquire the latch, we have two read, read workers already holding the latch in read mode, so it's going to have to stall and then maintain an internal uh, priority queue to keep track of like, what threads are waiting for this. So then, depending on the policy you can configure in the latch, if another thread comes along that wants to get it in read mode, and in theory I could I could acquire it because it's commutative with all the other latches or the other workers that hold it in read mode, I could acquire it right away. But it could, you can set the policy to say I know another thread is waiting for it in write mode. So let me go ahead and and, and put it to sleep. Right. And in C++, I think that they're, they're doing this all in in user space, not not down in the kernel. But it but when you have to then block and wait for the acquire the latch you're looking for, then that's going to be an OS current, or OS mutex, which we don't want to do. So the I'm just getting to showing you a high level overview of the, 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 the test and set operation, the compare and swap is the basic building block we used to build more complicated uh, uh, latch primitives. And depending on not where you want the OS to do it or not, uh, most systems most 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 bigger database systems, the enterprise ones, will not rely on the OS for anything. And it's a combination for portability and also uh, it, it's just faster to avoid the OS. And Linus was wrong. Okay? All right, so now let's see. Oh, sorry, yes? I just want to clarify. Is, is parking mutex also built on test and set? The question is, is parking mutex from Apple, is that built on test and set? All of them are, yes. Okay. Yeah, like that's the, does everyone know what compare and swap is? No, no. okay. I have slides. One slide. All right. So compare and swap is this atomic construction that, that modern CPUs provide that allow you to check a memory location to see whether it's a current whether the, the current value of that memory address is what you expect it to be. And if it is, then I can go ahead and overwrite it with my new value in again in a single instruction. Again, think if you had to do this in C code, it would be like, if the value equals this, then set it to that. But again, if that was just the, the actual instructions to do that, that would be multiple instructions. And by the time you go check to see whether that value is, is you know, is a full, is a flag set to true, by the time you go and then go to update it, somebody else might have squeaked in and sneaked in before you did and updated it before, before. 
And so on modern CPUs, you can do this in a single instruction that's atomic to guarantee that by when you check it and set it, no one else can get in before you do. And then that's the basic primitive that allows it to do more complicated things. So there's a bunch of different intrinsics in, in, in C and C++ you can use for this, right? They, they have different versions of this. Like some will, like, if, you, if the test and set can, can succeeds or the parent swap succeed, they'll return back the old value or the new value or true and false. But they're all basically doing the same thing. So let's say in this case here, for this intrinsic, I'm saying here's the address I want to check. Assume it's a 64-bit integer. Here's the value that I want to see whether it is it's currently set to. And then if it is, here's the value I want, want you to set it to right now. So we jump to this memory address here. It's 20. Is, is, does 20 equal 20? Yes. Then I can go ahead and overwrite it with 30. Pretty simple. But that's, again, that's the building block we need to have all, you know, to build our, all our more complicated latches. I don't know when uh, this compare and swap stuff was added. I think it was like the late 90s, at least in x86. So we good? OK, cool. All right. So let's see how we can do this for, ha for hash tables now, or use latching with hash tables. So hash table is going to be easy to support because, assuming we're going to do linear probe hashing, is that there's only certain many ways you can actually access the hash table. Right? I ha assuming it's linear, linear, linear probe hashing, I hash to some location into my hash, hash array or hash table, and I, then I scan down from top to down to looking for the entries I'm looking, you know, that I need. Right? And in this case here, because the threads are all moving in the same direction, like going top down, even though they may start at different locations in the hash table, I can't have any deadlocks. Because there isn't one thread going top down and another thread going bottom up. Right? So the question is going to be, to what granularity do we, do we want to have our latch to protect our data structure? Because that's going to determine the amount of parallelism we'll be able to support. For this lecture, we're going to ignore how to handle resizing the table. The, way, the simplest way to handle that is you have a sort of a right latch that protects the, uh, the, the you know, access to the data structure itself. So if I, if, I, if I get full and I need to double the size of it, I just switch that latch into right mode and then do my, my resizing. And that, avoids any, that prevents anybody else from coming in. Like that, that's the easiest way to do this. All right, so the scopes are, are, of our, our latches can either be within a page or a slot. And again, this is going to determine the amount of parallelism we have. So obviously, when a page latch is going to protect the entire page itself with a latch, and no matter whether you want to read one entry or, or all the entries in the page, you would, you would hold a latch on the entire thing. The alternative would be the, you would have a latch for every single slot in, in a page. And this is going to have, allow more fine-grained access. But again, now the, pro, the challenge is that it's going to take more space because every single, every single slot needs to have a latch. And now, as I'm scanning through my, uh, my hash table, I got to acquire the latch for every single slot as I'm going along. So again, there's no free lunch in, in, in systems or in computer science. It's either I have a single latch per page, which I only have to acquire once for the page, uh, and doesn't take a lot of space, but then it blocks everyone else out from reading the entire page, or I have it for every single slot. So say a real simple hash table like this. Uh, T1 wants to come along, a thread 1 wants to come along and find D. If we hash D, we land at this location here. We get the entire page in, in, in write mode. Look, try to find the, the entries that we're looking for by just scanning down. But at the same time, another thread wants to come along, wants to insert E. Same thing, I hash to this page, but the latch is already, the page is already latched in, in read mode, and that's not commutative with the write mode latch it needs to do the insert. So we'll have to stall thread 2. And again, whether it's spinning in, in user space or got descheduled by the kernel, that depends on your latch implementation. So now when, the, uh, when thread 1 is, is done scanning this page, it can jump to the next page. It, it still holds the latch to the page it started at because it needs to know how to, where to look at next right? to make sure nobody, nobody's moving things around. And so we, we, we can then release the latch on page number 1, uh, acquire the latch on page number 2, and then now thread 2 can start running and, and try to figure out where it wants to insert. And the same thing, it wants, it wants to come down here to do the right. The, 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 the read latch is not compatible with the right, mat, right latch, so therefore it has to wait. And then once thread 1 is done, uh, thread 2 can then acquire the latch and, and do the update to assert its entry. Right? Yes, question? If we have, uh, if we have a, a read latch acquired, and the right latch is waiting, and then we decide to read again, the order we schedule things in, isn't that sort of a race condition? 
the question is if I hold a so if I hold the I have a read latch. Uh, wait, sorry, say, say your scenario again. Sorry. I guess, I guess more broadly, what I'm trying to ask is, don't we run into race conditions like based on uh, whether the writer happens to sneak in before the reader, or whatever our scheduling policy is? Uh, so going back to like the very beginning here. Yeah, like, uh, sorry, like, not, like a race condition in terms of like what um, what our output is. Like if we have something trying to read at the same time we're trying to write. Uh, so, so, so say again, say this scenario here, say T2 shows up before T1, yeah. uh, and, and what's the race condition you're trying to deal with? Like, so if, if you, if you read, then write, then read again, but the scheduling policy has the two reads happen before the write. All right, so when you say read, write, you read, and then write, and then read, like yeah. that second read, is that like another find a key? Yeah. Say, so say I do find and then insert, then a find again. Yes. And what's, uh, and what's, if our scheduling policy puts the find before the, the write, then wouldn't that create a, a data rate? But is it wrong? Technically, no. But yeah. Well, well it's like we don't, we don't know if, if we're going to get the old value before the write or the new value after the write necessarily, right? Yeah. So, so, so. Oh, like if you have find D, insert D, find D again. So, yeah. So, yeah, so, 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 so there's a, all right. There's a, this is the logical correctness thing, right? Like, if, say I, I, I do a select, I run, a, I run a literal select query that does a lookup in this hash table and I, I find D, right? And I, and I get back the answer. Now, the, the, some other transaction, some other thread comes along and deletes D, right? And removes it from the hash table. Then, then the first thread again now runs another select query that finds D and it doesn't come back with it, right? Yeah. From the data structure perspective, that's fine for what we're talking about today. When we talk about after the midterm, that's, a, that's, a, um, that's an anomaly uh, of inconsistent reads, and that's something that the control mechanism for the system will handle in transaction level. At the low level level of the data structure, we don't care. It's correct. Who decides what, uh, in, in the order and what, 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 what rights we should see or not see, that's a higher level thing that comes later. Yes. And the great thing about databases or these transactions is like, there's multiple answers that are all technically correct, potentially. But we'll, we'll get to that later. Doesn't that depend on the spec specification of the database, I guess? No, the, it, well, in the specification of SQL, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a description about what is considered correct or not correct at different isolation levels, which we haven't covered yet. Okay. Right? And the, 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 the easiest, the, the, sorry, the most strictest correctness level would be, or isolation level would be called strict, strict serializable or strong serializable. Basically means that, like, Whoever comes first should should see the system as if it was running by itself, and its changes get applied first, right? And then everything else comes after that. But we're getting way way ahead of ourselves. From the data structure perspective, I don't care that your thread came in and, and deleted D. Find, look for D, then D got lit it, and you go to look for it again, and it's missing. That's not the data structure's problem. <laughs> That's somebody else's problem. And it, it's our problem, but like not not today's lecture. Future Earth problem, and it's really hard. Yeah. Oh, it's why all the NoSQL guys did new transactions at the beginning, because this shit's hard, right? Um, all right, we'll come to that later. They, 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 there's a lot of things they didn't do because it's hard. And then they eventually had to do it later. All right. Um, so, again, let me just show you how to do two slot latches. All right, again, now I have a latch on every single slot itself in my hash table. So now when I do a find D, I get the latch on the read latch on the, the slot itself. Uh, I go ahead and read what I'm looking for, and say this guy now wants to jump to this page. He wants to get the read la the right latch uh, on on C, on C. Ignore how he found that because he hashed there. Um, the now when the the first thread tries to get the read latch on the next slot, he can't because the other the, the other thread has the latch, so he has to stall. But at this point, uh, even though he's going to stall and wait, it's safe for him to release the latch on the previous previous slot because. He's, uh, how do I say this? There's, there's no issue, there's no reason for him to keep holding, holding this, this latch, right? Because he's just going to spin and wait for this thing here. And everything's still considered correct. Now, like, there's the, I mentioned, like, the reorganization of the, of, of, the, of the hash table itself. Like, if you have to resize it, assume that there's some other latch protecting the entire thing that's in, like, read mode. So that, that's okay. And, like, we only set that to write mode if we have to resize the whole thing. So, so the global latch for threat, th T2 would have the global latch in, in read mode. 
Yes. Clarify. So this is the slotted page. Library? No, think, think, this, is, this is just think of like it's like some offset in some page for our hash table. So it means all fixed length. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. So, so like this. Just dividing up the page into more parts. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yeah. And like it basically, do you want fine grain, fine grain latches or coarse grain latches? That's all it is. Okay. So this this should be pretty straightforward. Okay. Let's get to B plus trees because this is harder and and more fun. Um, so again, just like before, in our hash table, in a B plus tree, we want to have multiple threads read and write at the same time. Um, the challenge here is now, in the hash table, at least in linear probing, the, the number of pages was fixed. And, and the organization of the data structure was fixed. Meaning, like, you know, no matter if I, had, if I, if I create my hash table and I, I have, a, say, a million slots, it doesn't matter whether I have 1,000 threads going at it or one thread going at it. I'm always going to have a million slots. It doesn't matter if I have a, you know, a half a million keys in it or not. The data structure is always the same. In a B plus tree, since the data structure is, is, is self-organized or self-balancing, as I insert things into it or start deleting things from it, I, it's going to start reorganizing itself. So I need to make sure that as I'm reorganizing things, doing splits or merges, I, make sure that, uh, I have to make sure that the data structure is correct. All right, so let's see how things can go bad. Say we have our thread here, and they want to delete uh, key 44 at the bottom. So what do I do? I traverse down, and, and I look at the guidepost markers to figure out whether I want to go left and right, and I reach down to my, 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 my leaf node here, and I go ahead and delete it. But now I have to rebalance. I have to do a merge, because this, this, this leaf node is, 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 uh, is less than half full. So I'll, maybe I'll steal a, an entry from, from my sibling. Right? He's going to move 41 over. right? But before I can do that, uh, my thread gets descheduled, right? For whatever reason, the OS decided to do something. Gamma rays came down; doesn't matter, right? I, my thread's not running anymore. So now, while, I'm, while thread one is asleep, thread two comes along, and they want to find 41, and they start traversing down just like before, and they get here, right? And again, now they look at the guidepost. They follow the the, the they realize they, they want to go down to the to the right to the to node H, but now it gets descheduled for whatever reason. And then uh, thread one wakes up, moves 41. T1, T, thread two wakes up, goes down to the, the node it thought it needed to go to, and now the key's not there. Right? Best case scenario, you get a false negative here. Worst case scenario, you crash. Right? And, and the system fails, and, and you could, you could lose, you know, corrupt your data. Right? So we need latches to protect this thing. And so the technique we're going to use is called latch crabbing or latch coupling. I think the textbook calls it latch coupling. I think the Wikipedia calls it latch coupling, right? But it's basically the protocol we're going to use to, to decide at, as we traverse down to our tree uh, what, la what latches we want to take, and then when can we release the latches up above us. Because again, the easiest way to protect this entire data structure is put a, a giant latch on top of the whole thing, and then everyone has to get gatekeep through, but then that becomes uh, a bottleneck. So we, we want to be more clever and selectively release our latches as we go down when we know it's OK. So the basic protocol is, in order for me to go into the B plus tree, I, you, I mean, you always have to latch the root, but, the, but once I'm in my, my root, and I, I figure out whether I want to go left and right, and then I acquire the latch from my child that I'm going to go down from the current parent I'm at, and then once I know I'm OK, and I'm able to go there, I can release the, the, my parent latch for that current node I'm at if, if I know it's safe. And the definition of safe is going to be that we know that based on the operation we're trying to do, like an insert or delete, if it's, a, if it's an insert, we know that the child isn't full. And therefore, if I, if I have to do a, a, a split, um, I'm sorry, if I, when I insert my key, it's not going to cause me to do a split at that, at that child node, which may get propagated up to the parent. If I'm going to do a delete, if, it's, if I know that it's more than half full, then again, if I remove a key, I know I'm not going to do a merge, which again will propagate things up to, to my, my parent node here. Right? So again, the basic protocol is I start at the root, traverse down, acquire read latches on every child as I'm going down, because again, I'm doing a read operation. I'm not doing any updates. And then I just unlatch my parent. Um, if I do an insert or delete, I start at the root, taking right latches as I, as I go down, and then uh, once I have my child node that I'm going to move to in write mode, then I go check to see whether it's safe. And if it is safe, then I can go release any latches I have up above me. So let's go back to our example here. So I want to find key 38. Again, I start at the root, 
take the root in, in latch and root node in a right latch mode. Uh, I get down to sorry. Then I acquire the the, the right the read latch on B. Then I move down, and at this point here, it's safe for me to release the latch on on A because again, it's doing a read operation. I've already arrived at B where I need to go, so I'm good to go there. So I can go ahead and release the latch on B. Get the latch the read latch on D. Same thing. It's safe for me to release the latch on B, so I go ahead and do that, and I get down to H and, and so forth, and I finally get the key I'm looking for, and I'm done. All right. All right, this is delete 38 now. Again, start at the root. I get the root in, in root latch, the root node in right mode latch. Uh, I get a right latch on B, move down here. And again, at this point here, since if I, if I do a, I don't know what's going to happen below me in the tree below B. And because if I know if I have to delete a key from the node I'm currently at on B, I'm going to have to do a merge. So therefore, I can't release the latch on my parent A because I, I may have to go make changes to A up above. So I'm going to hold the right latch on, on, on B and A, get down to D. Now at D, I see that no matter what has to be, happens to me below in the tree, uh, if I have to remove a key from D, D's not going to have to do, do, a, do a merge. And therefore, it's not going to make any changes up above it. So I, it's safe for me to go ahead and release the, release the latches on A and B. Does the order matter? Sorry, question. Which node is the safe node? Whatever you're at now. Whatever the, whatever the like, so if I'm, if I'm at B, I get the, and I'm, I need to go to D. So I get, I get it in right, I get the latch in right mode. And then now I have it in right mode, then I check, am I safe? Because you can't check whether you're safe until you hold the latch on it. Since we're more than half full of D, then we say, all right, this is safe. So this is safe, and go ahead and release, release everybody up above me. Yes? This question is, is, is it being half full the only check to see whether it's safe? I mean, what, else would call, what else would cause a, a, a merge in case of a, a delete? That's the thing we only care about, is, like splits and merges. We're trying to make sure that we don't screw ourselves with that. All right, so, so, we, so at this point here at D, we had to release the latches on A and B. Because again, D is safe. Does the order in which we release those latches matter? I think it makes more sense to release going up, uh, so B first and then A. He says it makes more sense to release going like from the bottom to the top by releasing B followed by A. Why? Because if uh, someone is waiting on A, uh, we release it, and uh, if B is also released, then it does not have to wait for B. So, if, so if, if I so is he saying if I release B and someone's waiting for A. Yes. So if we release B and then A, then it does not have to wait for B. So he says if you release B, uh, then it does. Sorry, the other thread's waiting for B or A. Sorry. It has to go down the same path. Yeah, it has to go down the same path. Yeah. So it's it will try to acquire a lock on A first, but it's a latch. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it tries, okay. But if I release it on B, it's still waiting for A. Right. Also, too, what if I have a, I have a thread? That's waiting for A, but it wants to go down this side of the tree. But I, I release B. It's still blocked. So from a correctness reason, cor from a correctness standpoint, it doesn't actually matter. Like the system, the, 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 the data structure will still be correct whether you, you, you go from the bottom to the top, top to the bottom. For performance reasons, we want to go top down. Because we want to release, like the way to think about it is uh, the latch is protecting everything below it. So if I hold a right latch on the root, I'm protecting the entire data structure in right mode. Right. Um, now there may be a bunch of like read threads and other threads doing stuff over here, but that's okay because because it would have, if their modifications would have caused us to do a split or merge, then they up up the entire to the root, they would have to still hold the re, the right latch on this. So again, it, the the main takeaway is that we want to release latches as soon as possible, and so and we want to release latches that will have the most that would free up the most. Uh, the most number of workers in our data structure. So we always want to release from the top going down. All right, so then we get down here and we get the, the right latch on H. Go ahead and uh, do our delete and we're done. All right, so let's look at another example. We're going to insert 45, same idea. I get the right latch on the root on A, go down to B, 
at this point here, I know that uh, if if whatever is below me in the tree, if it has to do a split, I have room in B to accommodate another key. So it's okay for me to go release the latch on A, get down here on D. Now D is completely full. I don't know what's below me in the tree because I haven't gone there yet. Uh, so at this point here, it's not safe to release to release the latch on D until I go down. And now I can see that uh, inserting to I would not cause a split on, on node I. So I can go ahead and release the latches on uh, B and D and go, going top down. And I can insert my key. All right, let's look at one where there is a split. All right, and for, for simplicity, we, we, can, we can ignore sibling pointers. So I'm doing, doing insert 25. Uh, B is safe. I'm going to release the latch on A. I get down to C. C is safe. Release the latch on B. Then I get down to F. F is not safe. Uh, so I can't release the latch on, on C. And now I need to do a split. And that split's going to cause me to insert a new entry up into, into node C. So I'll go ahead and do that. Uh, add, my new, uh, add my new node J. I'm running out of space because it's PowerPoint. Again, we, we're ignoring sibling pointers for now. I go ahead and, and now do the update to the C. Could now now include this pointer, uh, and then once this is all once I apply all these changes, then I reach the latches going top down. So I've already given this answer before. But what was the very first thing I did for all these scenarios when I want to do updates, inserts, and deletes? What's the very first thing you have to do? Get a get a, get a latch on the yeah let, yeah get a latch on the root node, um, right? And like, yeah, that's correct, but this is a bottleneck now because it basically becomes a, almost a single-threaded data structure that everybody has to go into the system, uh, sorry, go into our data structure. The first thing you have to do is, is, is acquire the latch in write mode in the root. Even if you're doing reads, that's not going to be compatible, so it'll block all the readers too. Again, it's correct, but from a performance reasons, it's, it's, uh, it's not ideal. And so the, the common technique everyone uses is uh, this this optimistic uh, latching scheme I'll talk about now. Um, I don't think the algorithm has a name. It's from this paper from, I think it's from, from the 70s. Is there a date on that? 70, it says 77. Yeah, from this, these guys at IBM Bear and Schlockneck. I, sometimes it's called the Bear Schlockneck algorithm, which is kind of cumbersome to say. But it's based on this observation that you know that most of your threads, most of your workers, their operations are, are, are not going to cause a split or merge into to your your, to your, your B plus tree nodes. Again, in my examples here, I'm showing nodes with two keys in it because that's to fit it in PowerPoint. But in a real system, you know, the, the size of a node is going to be the page size of your database, so like 8 kilobytes, 16 kilobytes. And you can store a lot of keys. So the most of the times, you can do a bunch of inserts, or, and that's not, not going to cause any, any splits. And likewise for deletes. So if you assume that splits and mergers are going to be rare, then instead of taking right latches all the way down, even if you're doing the, 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 latch, the latch coupling scheme, you're going to take read latches all the way down until you get to uh, a leaf node right above the reef node. And then now you check to see whether that assumption that you're not going to have to do a split or merge is correct. And if it is, uh, then you go ahead and acquire the leaf node in, in write mode and, and then do your change. But if you're wrong, you just restart and then do the, the pessimistic approach of just taking write latches all the way down. So this would be a common theme you see, not just in databases, in a bunch of different systems in general. Right? This is sort of an optimistic scheme where you assume that you're not going to be any issues, not any problems, and you do the sort of the fast way of, 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 of making some change or doing something in your system. And then if you're wrong, you just roll it back and, and, and take care of it. Right? Um, Intel actually had this in, it was called TSX. We actually had this in the, uh, in the, the CPU itself. I, I think there was a bug in it. I think they turned it off. It might have got turned back on. But like, they, it was like this optimistic memory stuff where like, you could have a critical section where you assume, that it, would, it would assume you're not going to have any conflicts in some critical section. And then when you went to go apply the change, then you just additional check to see whether that, 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 uh, that assumption was correct. And if not, it would roll you back automatically. Um, but the base, again, we'll see this when we do talk about concurrent control for transactions. This is a very common technique. You, you do the fast thing because most of the times there won't be any issues. And if you're wrong, then you, you have to roll back and, and try again. All right, so with this better latching scheme for, for doing lookups and finds, that's the same as before. For inserts and deletes, again, we take, uh, we, we, 
basically do the search, taking right latches, or sorry, reed latches all the way down until we're one level above the, the leaf node. And then we know where we're at in the, in the, in the, in the data structure because you know, we, we can keep track of as, you know, how many levels down we, we are. Um, and either in the page or a simple counter would work too. Um, you go acquire the, the, the level right above the leaf node. You acquire the leaf node in, right, in the right mode. Then you check to see where it's safe. If it is safe, then you re release all your read latches that you took from before, apply your change, and you're done. If you're wrong, then you just release all your latches and go back and, and take right latches all the way down. You could take, you know, do the optimistic seam again, because you assume the next time you come back around, things will be safe. It depends on the implementation. And so this works really well in low contention environments, because again, you optimistically assume there won't be any conflicts, and most of the time you're correct. And so things run faster. All right, so let's go back from the example before. Let's delete key 38. Again, instead of taking the, the, the root node in, in, in a right latch mode, uh, I'm going to take it in read mode, keep going down till I get down to D. Now, D recognizes that it's one level above the leaf node. So I want to delete uh, key 38 from, from node H. So I take the H into right mode, check to see it's safe. It is. I can go delete it, uh, and I know I'm not going to do any. Uh, I'm not going to do any merges, right? So again, best case scenario, I, I, I traverse the data structure almost as, it, as if I was doing a read, and therefore I can have a, a max amount of parallelism, but just only at the bottom do I check to see whether that assumption was correct. See how to do insert, th insert 25. Again, take the root in, in read mode, take B in read mode, do the latch uh, coupling as I release latches as I, as I go down. Now I get down here into F. In case of F, because we're trying to do an insert, F doesn't have any more room, so it's not safe. So we're going to have to restart the whole operation and then just take right latches on the way down. Neat trick, right? OK. So in all these examples that I've shown so far, we were only going in one direction. We were only going top to the bottom. And as I said, there weren't any deadlocks because nobody, you know, everyone's going to the top. They're already starting at the same point and they're going down. There's no, you know, as I said last class, there's no pointers to your parent. So you can't go back up and because that's, that's where you could have conflicts. But again, because we're at a B plus tree, uh, we could have sibling pointers. And now we have a challenge where we could have one thread going one way, another thread going another way. And they both hold latches for what the other person wants, what the other thread wants, right? So now, we, now we got to deal with that scenario. You know, again, the original B plus three paper, this wasn't an issue, uh, but the B link stuff that came from CMU, that's where they added sibling pointers, and that's where you can have deadlocks. So let's, let's look at a simple example here. So I want to have a uh, thread one. They want to find all keys less than four. Uh, so I'm going to get the root in in read mode, and then get the C in read mode. And then let's say, uh, then it wants to scan, scan across. So it's going to follow the sibling pointers. So just like before, I hold whatever node I'm at now, I hold that in, in the current latch mode I have it. Uh, and then I then try to acquire the latch of where I want to go to. So in this case here, again, it wants to scan C, I want to go from C to B. So I hold the latch on C, get the latch on B, move over here, and then I can release the latch on C and then do whatever it is that, that I need to do. Right? So the protocol is basically the same thing, even though we're now we're moving uh, horizontally instead of vertically. Yes? I think this might be the same thing from earlier, but if we're reading this one, then a guy comes down, writes the other one, then we move across the read. That's the same scheduling problem. Uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that in a second, yes. The same scheduling problem, yes. All right, so again, the, the read modes are so committed, so, so I can have two threads doing read at the same time. I, the first thread goes down, or this goes down to C. Second thread goes down to B, and they want to go across each other. And in this case here, the the the, the two latches they're holding are commutative, uh, so therefore they can both do whatever it is that they, they need to do, right? That's fine. All right. So let's now do when we have a uh, one of the one of them wants to do a write, wants to do a read. So T1 wants to delete the key four, and T2 wants to find all keys greater than one. So they both start at the same time. I assume we're doing the optim optimistic lock coupling I just talked about, a latch coupling, where they start at the root, both get both in, um, in, in, in read mode. 
right? Uh, thread two goes down, takes B into read mode. Thread C goes down and takes, uh, takes uh, sorry, thread one goes down, takes node C in write mode. And that's the key that it wants to delete, right? But now, thread two is scanning across the leaf nodes, and it wants to acquire the latch the re on C in read mode, but it can't because T1 holds that in, in write mode. So we have to decide what we want to do here, right? And T2 doesn't know anything about, about T1. Because I said, there's no centralized data structure that says, here's the threads that are running, here's what, you know, here's what they're doing. All it sees, all it knows is that there's a latch on this other node that I want to go to, and it's currently in write mode, and that's not compatible with the mode I want to put it in. So you have, you have to do something. So what can, what can T2 do here? All right, the wait, that's one option. What else? What, what's that? Okay, let's sell. Are you reading the slides? OK. Uh, what's the third option? It can go street on the other thread and try to kill, <laughs> and kill it, right? And take the latch from it. So what, what do you think is a good idea here? What's that? It says wait for how long? Yeah, I heard forever. Uh, Till T1 is done. Till T1 is, uh, but how long? But how do you know, like, but how, Once it's, it realizes there isn't a latch on C. But that's just waiting, right? It's just spinning until the latch is available. But like, uh, how does it say this? Do you know what T, T1 is, sorry, do you, yeah, do you know what T1 is doing? No, we don't know anything, right? What's that? Do you? Well, yeah, you, you know it's in write mode, but how long is it going to take? Can you schedule one of them? Uh, how? <coughs> well, sorry, which one? Like, do you kill yourself and reschedule, or do you kill the other guy and reschedule? What do you want to do? Let's kill the other one. Oh. Kill, she says kill the other one. Fantastic. All right. Um, <laughs> how do you do that? Nice. What's that? Nice. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep a, what do you mean, keep a log of everything you've done in the past? Like, record like, all, the, all the operations you want to make, and if you want to reschedule, just like, go back to it. Like, if you like, kill it, then you go back. You mean, like, store a queue and say, like, okay, we'll come back and do that's that. That's an awful idea, though, for like, your memory, right? Yeah, that sounds expensive. I guess you can wait for a normal amount of time. What, what is a normal amount of time? Average time for a write to happen. Uh, he says, wait for the average time for a write to happen. Um, but like, you don't, how do I say this? In my, my simple example here, because I have to fit it on PowerPoint, it's, there's two nodes in the leaf, right? What if there was a bunch of leaf nodes all over here? I got to hold all these guys in, in, in everything in write mode, right? Because I want my changes to happen atomically. So I don't know whether this other thread keep going in the other direction. I don't, like, what is a normal time? You don't know. Could we, like, give up our write lock, let the other guy read? He says, give up your write lock and let the other guy read? But how do you know? How do you know they're waiting for you? Like, if you're T1, how do you know somebody else is trying to get, get your latch? Yeah. You don't. Yes. So we don't know anything about the other threads. The only thing we know is about ourselves and what we did. So then we should kill ourselves. Bingo. There you go. Excellent. Yes. So you should, ki <laughs> so you should kill yourself, right? Dance. Right. So killing another thread is hard because how think I, how do you implement that? Can you send an interrupt? And then I got an interrupt handle. That's expensive, right? That's a syscall, right? Is there like a flag you say, like, should I kill myself? And you have to check that every so often. How would that work, right? Uh, that's, now you're going checking some other memory location, right? And, and what do you get? You get the, you know, you don't know how much work the other thread is, the other thread is done. And therefore, like, uh, you don't know whether him aborting and rolling back is was way more expensive than, than, than you aborting yourself. You know nothing at this point, right? So the best thing to do is just kill yourself, and then you maybe also could wait a little bit in the beginning and then give up right away, depending on what you know you need to do, right? And so this is the simplest thing to do, and it, it, it turns out to be the best thing to do in most scenarios, almost all scenarios, because again, it's 
you don't know anything about the thread, you can't communicate with the other thread because that's expensive, and you're just better off just aborting and starting over again. Yes? Uh, we face the same thing when going downwards in the tree, right? When, because if someone has taken the right lock on the node below us, we'll have the similar option. Yeah, so his statement is, um, you would have to wait also too, or, or carry yourself too, like when you're doing the traversal of the tree going top down, like if I try to acquire a latch on somebody else on, on the next node, but that, that's already being held, what do I do? It's the same scenario here. Exact same scenario. Exact same scenario. But in that case, it's not, you're not, it, it, you, you won't deadlock though, right? The problem is like, again, if, if T2 wants to get the latch on, on if T1 wants to get the latch on B, and, and T2 wants to get the latch on C, th that's a deadlock, you don't know that it's a deadlock or just contention requiring some latch, right? So you, the, the, the best thing to do is just immediately give up. And so that means you could have a scenario where like, you hold the latch and I hold the latch, and then one of us should only give up, but we end up both giving up and killing ourselves, right? Uh, but again, it, the, the cost of, of maintaining metadata about who's waiting for what and in what way, that's more expensive to do in like the regular case where you assume there isn't contention. Yeah, so it was this one here, right? So they're both doing reads, but assume they're both doing writes, right? I, I need to do, I need to update all keys greater than one or something. He needs to update keys less than four, right? I'm going this way, he's going that way. We have, that's a deadlock. Updating multiple keys in the same, uh, by the same thread, essentially. Think in terms of latches. I'm trying to acquire latch on, on, on this direction, trying to crash on, on that direction, and we're deadlocked. The question is, how do you prevent both of them killing themselves? So, like, you can't, because I don't know. I don't know you exist. I don't know what you're doing, right? Uh, the, and, you know, if you just think of the computers in general, like, it's very unlikely that you and I are going to be exact lockstep in our threads in the exact same like number of cycles. We're both going to try to acquire a latch together. That then it would deadlock when we go kill each other. It's it's a it's a race condition, but it's 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 rare. But you can't prevent it. Because again, the cost of preventing it is so expensive. The statement is, uh, f from a philosophical standpoint, uh, it would be more efficient to kill the other one. Would that be better? <laughs> it's not really a philosophical question. It's just like straight up, is it better? Um, <laughs> like you take their wallet, whatever. Like um, you like. Again, this is a toy example where like it's only one node. Like if you think about. I don't know what the I don't know what work you've done. I don't you don't know what work I've done. If we can sort of keep tra track of that, then we may we may be able to decide. Okay, well you hold five latches, I hold one. It's better to kill me because you did a, you had to wait a bunch of time to get those five latches. So like that's sort of a high level what what the we'll do when we do transactions. They'll figure out who who gets priority or others based on how much work they've done so far. At this lowest level, the latches are meant to be so like fine grained and short. It's better just to kill yourself. Right. Okay. So let's say T two isn't waiting on T one. Okay. Then T one kills itself, tries again, <coughs> still bad, kills itself again, does it a million times, right? Yes. Who's to say that isn't possible? It is possible. So the question is, could you basically have could you starve a thread is the term you want to use. Could you starve a thread because every single time it tries to get something, it uh, it can't because someone else is in there. Could you starve that? Yes. So, I think I have a slide on this, let me see. Yeah, so, there's, I'll, 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 I'll answer your question in a second. Like, the, the latches, the, latch, again, the latches aren't gonna have anything to handle deadlocks for us, and it's not gonna have anything that can prevent starvation. In the read-write latches, you can set priorities, like writers over readers, or, or you wanna do FIFO or round robin scheduling. Um, but there's a high level construct, a scheduler that can decide, oh, this, this, this worker is trying to run this query, she's trying to touch this data structure, and it keeps getting aborted. And I know it's getting aborted uh, because it, you know, it's coming back with a retry message. And therefore, maybe I want to deschedule other th workers running at the same time to make sure I always get through. That's a way to basically handle that. Uh, most systems basically let, you know, let Jesus take the wheel, whatever the phrase you want to use, and just, just, you know, just let it go at it, right? 
because uh, eventually the you, you know you should get through. Now again, if I have like a, a you know a, a, a thousand queries trying to run at the same time, trying to all update the same key, there's no magic scheduler that's going to be able to like handle that. That's, everything's going to sort of get contended and it end up being a single thread system. So we want to optimize for the 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 case where we we assume that the uh, we assume contention is going to be low, and we want to sort of fast fail fast, no wait policy. We just check, can I do it? No, okay, let me retry again. Because by the time, you know, when I go go retry, uh, then, then I'll be able to do what I need to do. Uh, while killing yourself, do you roll back any changes you do? His question is, if you, while you're killing yourself, do you have to roll back any changes that you do? Yes, in the code, yes. So again, if I, if, going back to the writer example here, like if, 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 if this thread that kills itself, if they had updated a bunch of things, that's why you hold the right latches for those things you've updated so you can go back and, and reverse those changes. Is it possible to get like, deadlock while doing this? It's possible to get deadlocked. No, why would you get deadlocked? If you already hold the latch, why would you get deadlocked? Yeah. So in what scenario is the, the, is the backwards sibling pointer beneficial? Because in this scenario, you, like, for applying keys left and forward, you like, start at the beginning and then you go across. So like what in what scenarios like do we even need the backwards pointer? So his question is in what in what scenario do you need the backwards pointer in the sibling because because it seems like it's causing problems for us, right? Yeah. Your query is this, right? Find keys less than four. Find keys greater than one. But for, for because we know everything's ordered, like in this case, we could just start at one and then go into the find four, right? Uh, same as you could start at one and go into you find four. Yeah, then just core everything. So so in what scenario like? But that I, I, think, I have a billion keys. Right, like, okay. and I, yeah, that's just way more expensive. Nobody does that. Yeah. Uh, Essentially make all queries go one direction. Yeah, so, so I, we, we didn't talk about skip lists. There was a, there was, actually it was single store, before, before it was single store, it was memsql. They had these skip lists, and skip lists only have, because they, it's a, it's a lock-free data structure, which is a bad idea. It's another, to, another topic, but like, they, they had their skip list could only go in one direction. So they had to do a bunch of tricks of like having ways to jump into the data structure to, to like try to do reverse and then sort it in reverse after you know after, after you get it out. It just makes life harder. Uh, you can do it and avoids uh, this deadlock issue. Um, but it, it's still the example. He says, "Boy, if you're traversing down, if I can't acquire the latch as I'm going down, it's not a deadlock. But I still want to kill myself potentially, usually." It's still, it's still, ordering it's, this, you have to. Yeah, so, no, so, so <coughs> you still, so you won't have deadlocks if you do what, you, do what you're proposing, but you still could have latch contention where I can't get the latch because somebody else holds it. And in that case, again, usually you want to spin for a little bit and then kill yourself. Uh, okay. Yeah, you still want to kill yourself. That sounds weird, but you know what I mean. <laughs> uh. Yes? Like the, the only issue that we saw with like the waiting was that we don't know how long we'd be waiting for, but yeah. then, like, Would there be like a heuristic where we would like want to wait for a certain amount of time, and then like if we still don't get the latch after that amount of time, we kill ourselves? Yeah. So he's right. Uh, I'll repeat what he said. So he basically said it's ex it, it if if we're a thread, we know how much work we've done, and we say we, we did a lot of updates. We know that they were expensive to do. Uh, so could we have a heuristic that says when we spin, we can determine how long we want to wait based on how much work we've done? Yes, you could do that. I I, I don't think Postgres MySQL. Actually, do that. I might, I might be wrong. But would, it be, would it be beneficial, or is like just the time of just like going back and doing it, like in the next revision, like done? Uh, would, would it be beneficial? I mean, you can imagine a really simple heuristic: a counter. I have a counter in my, you know, local address, local memory for my worker. Um, how many pages have I updated? And for each page I updated, wait maybe an extra, you know, hundred mi microseconds, something like that. You, you simple heuristics. I don't know whether it actually makes sense or not to do it. Again, it's a cop out for all cases in databases. It depends on the workload. It depends on like, uh, you know, if everything, everybody's updating a bunch of stuff, then maybe that's a bad idea. But you have one thread, one worker that updates a little bit of things, then maybe yeah, that might make sense. But once again, if everybody try to update the same key, it gets everything gets bogged, boggled down to to a, a single threaded system. There's, that's the extreme case though. Yes. How do you handle that? Yeah, like, They're dead. I mean, you, you, they restart. You, yeah. You yeah. Trigger restart 
Yeah, so, so, so very clear, I may, I may have said this in the slide. The restart mechanism is transparent to the user. Um, yeah, I don't have slides about this. So like, like I run a query and I have to traverse a B plus tree and, I, and, and to go look at the primary key and I can't get a latch as I'm going down. I don't want to abort the query and go back to the user. And, hey, look, I couldn't get a latch because they don't know what a latch is, right? And then and tell, tell the restart. We do this transparently for you. So like, so like you submit one query, it may restart the, the traversal of the B plus tree multiple times and, but you don't see that from the end user of the application. We're doing it internally. It's just the query got a little bit slower because of that. Yeah. A lot of questions. Sorry. Yes. Is there an instance where restarting is not possible because someone has like a write lock in the loop and so the other connection is like waiting for that? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the question is, is there a scenario where someone has a write latch on the root and therefore if you restart, you're going to come back and immediately yeah. abort? Yeah, absolutely, yes. It's unavoidable. I mean, as, as the more keys you insert, the the, the tree gets taller, uh, and therefore the uh, the you know the likelihood that someone's going to hold a right latch on the root goes down, right? Um, going back to like the the stall stuff too, like it's not just how much work is the other thread doing, like. Um, that, that, like you have to sort of wait for. Remember, these these data structures are backed by pages in the buffer pool that are on <laughs> disk. So even though I'm updating one key, the key I need to update might be not in memory, and I got to go out to disk and get it. So that's why, like, and you don't want to stall, you don't want to spin forever for a long time because you don't know, like, you know, it has to go get to disk. If it's a really slow disk, and that's gonna be a, you know a long time, and you could be waiting for 100 milliseconds you know, 500 milliseconds. So you said like, oh yeah, do, do the average time. I mean, it depends on so many different factors that'd be impossible to track these things. Again, this is, again, this is why this is different than like taking a regular data structure algorithm class is because these things are backed by disk uh, and we're having multiple threads running at the same time and we, there's a bunch of things we need to do to like, to hide that, those distals. SQL Server is a whole another beast. SQL Server, uh, they have they actually have their own user space coroutines. So like if you're traversing the data structure uh, and the thing I need, I can't get the latch, instead of just spinning, they go back to their own user space scheduler and says, I can't I can't run because I'm waiting for this latch. And then they take your thread away and have it do some other work. And then they may know what latch you're waiting for. Like they're actually doing some tracking about, about who's waiting for what latches inside of it. Uh, and can, they can do that because everything is, is coroutines in user space. Um, very few. Nobody else does that. Uh, SQL Server does some really cool things. All right, cool. Any other questions? Yes. Oh wait, it, is there like still more? No. Yeah, it, it, okay. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just had a pretty basic question about the whole setup. Yes. If there's two threads going in different directions, why do you need to hold the latch on the old page before until you acquire the latch? Yeah, so his question is, let me go back here. His question is, if I'm traversing along the sibling nodes, uh, this one here, right? If, if they're trying to get across, why does, so th T2 is at B, T1 is at C, why does T2 need to hold the, the, the latch on B in order to get to C? Because you need to know that the sibling pointer is still valid and this is the right, the right node that this is the right node you should be looking to, right? And you know that if there was an update, because you hold this in, in read mode, nobody can update it. So you know that no one's gonna replace B with something, with some, you know, some other new version of it that now points to something else, and you, but you're still gonna follow the pointer to, to whatever you thought was there before, right? So you have to hold the latches until you know you're safe on the other side, then you can go ahead and release it. Same thing, it's, you know, going from top down, you need to know that like, the thing I'm jumping to next is where I, what I should be jumping into. Yes. Um, so essentially, there are two, there are two cases that we discussed. Uh, this is on the leaf node, uh, both are in the opposite directions, but we can lock from the top, and you mentioned that there are sibling pointers in the middle nodes as well. Yes. So how do you distinguish that, okay, uh, this, uh, you, you want to go to the right, um, and you've taken a lock on, like, 
the whole branch. Now, how do you know that this is not the case where we like both of them are going in the opposite direction, or like? There are two cases. How do you distinguish between that? Yeah, so, so his question, the statement is um, a question that, like, last time I, I talked about how systems like Postgres have sibling pointers at inner nodes, even though I'm only showing, showing leaf nodes here. And if I use those inner node sibling pointers to jump, again, horizontally, how do I take latches on those and make sure that things are still correct? So the protocol, the, everything I'm describing here would still work um, if... For reads, it's simple because you just take the read latch across. Because uh, anybody else that coming coming above you once you are right, they'll see your read latch and they'll stop. Anything below below that side of the tree that was doing an update, you'll get blocked. You take the read take the read down. So that's fine. For doing updates, I think it works the same way. As you come across, um, if what you're trying to do below is not safe then you would still hold latches for those things. So the protocol still works even if you have to go across horizontally and go down. You still have the deadlock if everyone's trying to go across vertically on you or horizontally on you too, and then you do the same thing I'm describing here. There's another question, sorry. Okay, cool. Um, so, all right, just to finish up. So this is hard. Uh, and I'm showing you like the most simplest version to do latch crabbing and, and death detection. Um, there's, you know, we're not gonna cover this in this class, but there's, there's way more complicated schemes. You can have version latches, uh, you can have uh, delayed updates, you, you can do the B epsilon tree style where you delay things. There's a, there's a bunch of other stuff you can do this. Um, there's the BW tree is a lock free B, B plus tree from Microsoft. That's a whole other nightmare. Um, but Again, this is hard, but this is good because this is like you take this class, and this is why you know you don't want your re your random JavaScript programmer building your your B plus trees or data structures in your database systems. You want you want CMU students like you guys that know what the hell they're doing and, and make sure that you don't cause problems. Um, and so, again, we talked about hash tables, we talked about B plus, B plus trees today, but these techniques of this idea of like everything's going the same direction, or I kill myself as soon as I can't get something and restart, like this is this is relevant to. Uh, to a bunch of other data structures in, in systems as well, right? I feel like we should just call this course "Kill Yourself," right? Which is not. <laughs> that's, that's asking for CMU to get involved. I don't. I don't need that trouble. Sorry. Um, one year, somebody did complain that I did say "kill yourself" a lot. Um, <laughs> sorry. All right. So, so next class, we're talking about sorting or sorry, aggregations. So, like this point, like we're moving up the stack. Now we can actually start executing queries. Fantastic, right? Um, so. I won't be here on, on Monday, or I'm, I'm not teaching Jignesh Patel, he'll, he'll be the other professor, he's gonna start teaching on, on Monday. Um, and then Wednesday next week, he and I are both gonna be gone. I'm going to the Postgres conference in New York. I'm giving a keynote there about databases. Uh, I don't know where Jignesh is, he might have to go talk to his parole officer. Um, the, uh, but like, we'll have one of my PhD students, my number one PhD student, Matt Buchevich, will be teaching on Wednesday next week about joins, okay? Um, and then, uh, yeah, Jignesh is awesome, Jignesh, Ask him about growing up in India, because he, he like before he joined the CMU, he was telling me crazy stories. He used to get in fights every morning on the bus going to going to school, and I think he carried a knife. Um, ask him about it. Okay, uh, and then we'll have we'll talk about the midterm on um, on next week as well. Okay, all right, hit it. <laughs> this shit is gangsta. Gangsta. That boy's a gangsta. Listen, I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cooked up. You ain't hit a mob yet, still got you shook up. I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps, the feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof, you can't lace that. The Dominican, or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 will send you to the pearly gates. You get consignment trying to skate, and that's your first mistake. <laughs> I ain't lying for that cake, your family see you wake. My grams is heavyweight, then ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great. <laughs>